The Aerospatia, BAC Concorde is a French-British turbojet-powered supersonic passenger airliner that was operated from 1976 until 2003. It had a maximum speed over twice the speed of sound at Mach 2.04 1,354 miles per hour or 2,180 kilometers per hour at cruise altitude, with seating for 92 to 128 passengers. First flown in 1969, Concorde entered service in 1976 and continued flying for the next 27 years. It is one of only two supersonic transports to have been operated commercially, the other is the Soviet-built Tupolev Tu-144, which operated in service from 1977 to 1978. Concorde was jointly developed and manufactured by Sud Aviation later Aerospatia and the British Aircraft Corporation BAC under an Anglo-French treaty. Twenty aircraft were built, including six prototypes and development aircraft. Air France AF and British Airways BA were the only airlines to purchase and fly Concorde. The aircraft was used mainly by wealthy passengers who could afford to pay a high price in exchange for the aircraft's speed and luxury service. For example, in 1997, the round-trip ticket price from New York to London was $7,995 dollars in 2018 dollars, more than 30 times the cost of the cheapest option to fly this route. The original program cost estimate of £70 million met huge overruns and delays, with the program eventually costing £1.3 billion. It was this extreme cost that became the main factor in the production run being much smaller than anticipated. Later, another factor which affected the viability of all supersonic transport programs was that supersonic flight could only be used on ocean crossing routes, to prevent sonic boom disturbance over populated areas. With only seven airframes each being operated by the British and French, the per unit cost was impossible to recoup, so the French and British governments absorbed the development costs. British Airways and Air France were able to operate Concorde at a profit, in spite of very high maintenance costs, because the aircraft was able to sustain a high ticket price. Among other destinations, Concorde flew regular transatlantic flights from London's Heathrow Airport and Paris's Charles de Gaulle Airport to John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York, Washington Dulles International Airport in Virginia, and Grantley Adams International Airport in Barbados. It flew these routes in less than half the time of other airliners. Concorde won the 2006 Great British Design Quest organised by the BBC and the Design Museum, beating other well-known designs such as the BMC Mini, the Mini Skirt, the Jaguar E-Type, the London Tube Map and the Supermarine Spitfire. The Type was retired in 2003, three years after the crash of Air France Flight 4590, in which all passengers and crew were killed. The general downturn in the commercial aviation industry after the September 11 attacks in 2001 and the end of maintenance support for Concorde by Airbus the successor company of both Aerospatia and BAC also contributed. <laughs> <laughs> development <laughs> Early studies The origins of the Concorde project date to the early 1950s, when Arnold Hall, director of the Royal Aircraft Establishment Ray, asked Murray and Morgan to form a committee to study the supersonic transport SST, concept. The group met for the first time in February 1954 and delivered their first report in April 1955, at the time it was known that the drag at supersonic speeds was strongly related to the span of the wing. This led to the use of very short span, very thin trapezoidal wings such as those seen on the control surfaces of many missiles, or in aircraft like the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter or the Avro 730 that the team studied. The team outlined a baseline configuration that looked like an enlarged Avro 730. This same short span produced very little lift at low speed, which resulted in extremely long takeoff runs and frighteningly high landing speeds. In an SST design, this would have required enormous engine power to lift off from existing runways, and to provide the fuel needed. Some horribly large aeroplanes resulted. Based on this, the group considered the concept of an SST infeasible, and instead suggested continued low-level studies into supersonic aerodynamics. Topic: <laughs> Slender deltas. 
Soon after, Joanna Weber and Dietrich Kutcherman at the Ray published a series of reports on a new wing platform, known in the UK as the Slender Delta concept. The team, including Eric Maskell, whose report, Flow Separation in Three Dimensions, contributed to an understanding of the physical nature of separated flow, worked with the fact that delta wings can produce strong vortices on their upper surfaces at high angles of attack. The vortex will lower the air pressure and cause lift to be greatly increased. This effect had been noticed earlier, notably by Chuck Yeager in the Convair XF-92, but its qualities had not been fully appreciated. Weber suggested that this was no mere curiosity, and the effect could be deliberately used to improve low-speed performance. Kutcherman's and Weber's papers changed the entire nature of supersonic design almost overnight. Although the Delta had already been used on aircraft prior to this point, these designs used planforms that were not much different from a swept wing of the same span. Weber noted that the lift from the vortex was increased by the length of the wing it had to operate over, which suggested that the effect would be maximized by extending the wing along the fuselage as far as possible. Such a layout would still have good supersonic performance inherent to the short span, while also offering reasonable takeoff and landing speeds using vortex generation. The only downside to such a design is that the aircraft would have to take off and land very nose high to generate the required vortex lift, which led to questions about the low speed handling qualities of such a design. It would also need to have long landing gear to produce the required angle of attack while still on the runway. Kutcherman presented the idea at a meeting where Morgan was also present. Test pilot Eric Brown recalls Morgan's reaction to the presentation, saying that he immediately seized on it as the solution to the SST problem. Brown considers this moment as being the true birth of the Concorde project. Topic. Supersonic Transport Aircraft Committee On 1 October 1956 the Ministry of Supply asked Morgan to form a new study group, the Supersonic Transport Aircraft Committee stack, sometimes referred to as the Supersonic Transport Advisory Committee, with the explicit goal of developing a practical SST design and finding industry partners to build it. At the very first meeting, on 5 November 1956, the decision was made to fund the development of a testbed aircraft to examine the low-speed performance of the Slender Delta, a contract that eventually produced a Handley Page HP.115. This aircraft would ultimately demonstrate safe control at speeds as low as 69 miles per hour, 111 kilometers per hour, about one third that of the F-104 Starfighter. Stack stated that an SST would have economic performance similar to existing subsonic types. Although they would burn more fuel in crews, they would be able to fly more sorties in a given period of time, so fewer aircraft would be needed to service a particular route. This would remain economically advantageous as long as fuel represented a small percentage of operational costs, as it did at the time. Stack suggested that two designs naturally fell out of their work a transatlantic model flying at about Mach 2, and a shorter range version flying at perhaps Mach 1.2. Morgan suggested that a 150-passenger transatlantic SST would cost about £75 to £90 million to develop, and be in service in 1970. The smaller 100-passenger short-range version would cost perhaps £50 to £80 million, and be ready for service in 1968. To meet this schedule, development would need to begin in 1960, with production contracts let in 1962. Morgan strongly suggested that the US was already involved in a similar project, and that if the UK failed to respond it would be locked out of an airliner market that he believed would be dominated by SST aircraft. In 1959, a study contract was awarded to Hawker Siddeley and Bristol for preliminary designs based on the Slender Delta concept, which developed as the HSA.1000 and Bristol 198. Armstrong Whitworth also responded with an internal design, the M Wing, for the lower speed shorter range category. Even at this early time, both the Stack Group and the government were looking for partners to develop the designs. In September 1959, Hawker approached Lockheed, and after the creation of British Aircraft Corporation in 1960, the former Bristol team immediately started talks with Boeing, General Dynamics, Douglas Aircraft, and Sud Aviation. Sort 
Topic: Ogi Planform selected. Kuchiman and others at the Ray continued their work on the slender delta throughout this period, considering three basic shapes: the classic straight edge delta, the Gothic delta that was rounded outwards to appear like a Gothic arch, and the ogival wing that was compound rounded into the shape of an ogi. Each of these planforms had its own advantages and disadvantages in terms of aerodynamics. As they worked with these shapes, a practical concern grew to become so important that it forced selection of one of these designs. Generally, one wants to have the wing center of pressure (CP) or lift point close to the aircraft's center of gravity (CG) or balance point to reduce the amount of control force required to pitch the aircraft. As the aircraft layout changes during the design phase, it is common for the CG to move fore or AFT. With a normal wing design this can be addressed by moving the wing slightly fore or AFT to account for this. With a delta wing running most of the length of the fuselage, this was no longer easy, moving the wing would leave it in front of the nose or behind the tail. Studying the various layouts in terms of CG changes, both during design and changes due to fuel use during flight, the Ogi planform immediately came to the fore. While the wing planform was evolving, so was the basic SST concept. Bristol's original Type 198 was a small design with an almost pure slender delta wing, but evolved into the larger Type 223. Topic. Partnership with Sud Aviation By this time similar political and economic concerns in France had led to their own SST plans. In the late 1950s the government requested designs from both the government-owned Sud Aviation and Nord Aviation, as well as Dassault. All three returned designs based on Kutcherman and Weber's Slender Delta. Nord suggested a ramjet powered design flying at Mach 3, the other two were jet powered Mach 2 designs that were similar to each other. Of the three, the Sud Aviation Super Caravelle won the design contest with a medium range design deliberately sized to avoid competition with transatlantic U.S. designs they assumed were already on the drawing board. As soon as the design was complete, in April 1960, Pierre Satter, the company's technical director, was sent to Bristol to discuss a partnership. Bristol was surprised to find that the Sud team had designed a very similar aircraft after considering the SST problem and coming to the very same conclusions as the Bristol and Stack teams in terms of economics. It was later revealed that the original Stack report, marked, for UK eyes only, had secretly been passed to the French to win political favour. Sud made minor changes to the paper, and presented it as their own work. Unsurprisingly, the two teams found much to agree on. The French had no modern large jet engines, and had already concluded they would buy a British design anyway as they had on the earlier subsonic Caravelle. As neither company had experience in the use of high heat metals for airframes, a maximum speed of around Mach 2 was selected so aluminium could be used, above this speed the friction with the air warms the metal so much that aluminium begins to soften. This lower speed would also speed development and allow their design to fly before the Americans. Finally, everyone involved agreed that Kutcherman's ogi shaped wing was the right one, the only disagreements were over the size and range. The UK team was still focused on a 150-passenger design serving transatlantic routes, while the French were deliberately avoiding these. However, this proved not to be the barrier it might seem. Common components could be used in both designs, with the shorter range version using a clipped fuselage and four engines, the longer one with a stretched fuselage and six engines, leaving only the wing to be extensively redesigned. The teams continued to meet through 1961, and by this time it was clear that the two aircraft would be considerably more similar in spite of different range and seating arrangements. A single design emerged that differed mainly in fuel load. More powerful Bristol Siddeley Olympus engines, being developed for the TSR-2, allowed either design to be powered by only four engines. Topic. Cabinet response, treaty While the development teams met, French Minister of Public Works and Transport Robert Bouron was meeting with the UK Minister of Aviation Peter Thornycroft, and Thornycroft soon revealed to the Cabinet that the French were much more serious about a partnership than any of the US companies. 
The various U.S. companies had proved uninterested in such a venture, likely due to the belief that the government would be funding development and would frown on any partnership with a European company, and the risk of giving away. U.S. technological leadership to a European partner. When the stack plans were presented to the UK cabinet, a very negative reaction resulted. The economic considerations were considered highly questionable, especially as these were based on development costs, now estimated to be £150 million, which were repeatedly overrun in the industry. The Treasury Ministry in particular presented a very negative view, suggesting that there was no way the project would have any positive financial returns for the government, especially in light that, "...the industry's past record of over-optimistic estimating including the recent history of the TSR.2 suggests that it would be prudent to consider the £150 million cost to turn out much too low." This concern led to an independent review of the project by the Committee on Civil Scientific Research and Development, which met on topic between July and September 1962. The committee ultimately rejected the economic arguments, including considerations of supporting the industry made by Thornycroft. Their report in October stated that it was unlikely there would be any direct positive economic outcome, but that the project should still be considered for the simple reason that everyone else was going supersonic, and they were concerned they would be locked out of future markets. Conversely, it appeared the project would not be likely to significantly impact other, more important, research efforts. After considerable argument, the decision to proceed ultimately fell to an unlikely political expediency. At the time, the UK was pressing for admission to the European Common Market, which was being controlled by Charles de Gaulle who felt the UK's special relationship with the US made them unacceptable in a pan-European group. Cabinet felt that signing a deal with Sud would pave the way for common market entry, and this became the main deciding reason for moving ahead with the deal. It was this belief that had led the original stack documents being leaked to the French. However, de Gaulle spoke of the European origin of the design, and continued to block the UK's entry into the common market. The development project was negotiated as an international treaty between the two countries rather than a commercial agreement between companies and included a clause, originally asked for by the UK, imposing heavy penalties for cancellation. A draft treaty was signed on 29 November 1962. Topic. Naming Reflecting the treaty between the British and French governments that led to Concorde's construction, the name Concorde is from the French word Concorde IPA, K -Killard, which has an English equivalent, Concorde. Both words mean agreement, harmony or union. The name was officially changed to Concorde by Harold Macmillan in response to a perceived slight by Charles de Gaulle. At the French rollout in Toulouse in late 1967, the British government minister for technology, Tony Benn, announced that he would change the spelling back to Concord. This created a nationalist uproar that died down when Benn stated that the suffix e represented excellence, England, Europe, and Entente cordiale. In his memoirs, he recounts a tale of a letter from an irate Scotsman claiming. Why our talk about e for England, but part of it is made in Scotland. Given Scotland's contribution of providing the nose cone for the aircraft, Ben replied, I t was also e for ICOS, the French name for Scotland, and I might have added e for extravagance and e for escalation as well. Concorde also acquired an unusual nomenclature for an aircraft. In common usage in the United Kingdom, the type is known as Concorde without an article, rather than the Concorde or a Concorde. Topic sales efforts described by Flight International as an aviation icon, and one of aerospace's most ambitious but commercially flawed projects, Concorde failed to meet its original sales targets, despite initial interest from several airlines. At first, the new consortium intended to produce one long-range and one short-range version. However, prospective customers showed no interest in the short-range version and it was dropped. An advertisement covering two full pages, promoting Concorde, ran in the 29th of May 1967 issue of Aviation Week and Space Technology. The advertisement predicted a market for 350 aircraft by 1980 and boasted of Concorde's head start over the United States SST project. Concorde had considerable difficulties that led to its dismal sales performance. 
Costs had spiraled during development to more than six times the original projections, arriving at a unit cost of £23 million in 1977, equivalent to £140.36 million in 2018. Its sonic boom made travelling supersonically over land impossible without causing complaints from citizens. World events had also dampened Concorde's sales prospects, the 1973–74 stock market crash and the 1973 oil crisis had made many airlines cautious about aircraft with high fuel consumption rates, and new wide-body aircraft, such as the Boeing 747, had recently made subsonic aircraft significantly more efficient and presented a low-risk option for airlines. While carrying a full load, Concorde achieved 15.8 passenger miles per gallon of fuel, while the Boeing 707 reached 33.3 pm per gram, the Boeing 747 46.4 pm per gram, and the McDonnell Douglas DC 1053.6 pm per gram. An emerging trend in the industry in favor of cheaper airline tickets had also caused airlines such as Qantas to question Concorde's market suitability. The consortium secured orders, i.e., non-binding options, for over 100 of the long-range version from the major airlines of the day. Pan Am, BRAC, and Air France were the launch customers, with six Concorde's each. Other airlines in the order book included Pan Air de Brazil, Continental Airlines, Japan Airlines, Lufthansa, American Airlines, United Airlines, Air India, Air Canada, Braniff, Singapore Airlines, Iran Air, Olympic Airways, Qantas, CAAC Airlines, Middle East Airlines, and TWA. At the time of the first flight the options list contained 74 options from 16 airlines. Topic. Testing The design work was supported by a preceding research program studying the flight characteristics of low-ratio delta wings. A supersonic ferry Delta II was modified to carry the OGI planform, and, renamed as the BAC-221, used for flight tests of the high-speed flight envelope. The Handley Page HP.115 also provided valuable information on low-speed performance. Construction of two prototypes began in February 1965, 001, built by Aerospatia at Toulouse, and 002, by BAC at Filton, Bristol. Concorde 001 made its first test flight from Toulouse on 2 March 1969, piloted by André Turcat, and first went supersonic on 1 October. The first UK-built Concorde flew from Filton to RAF Fairford on 9 April 1969, piloted by Brian Trubshaw. Both prototypes were presented to the public for the first time on 7–8 June 1969 at the Paris Air Show. As the flight program progressed, 001 embarked on a sales and demonstration tour on 4 September 1971, which was also the first transatlantic crossing of Concorde. Concorde 002 followed suit on 2 June 1972 with a tour of the Middle and Far East. Concorde 002 made the first visit to the United States in 1973, landing at the new Dallas Fort Worth Regional Airport to mark that airport's opening. During testing, Concorde FWTSB attained the highest altitude recorded in sustained level flight of a passenger aircraft of 68,000 feet in June 1973. Concorde GAXDN attained the highest recorded speed of Mach 2.23 on the 26th of March 1974 at an altitude of 63,700 feet. While Concorde had initially held a great deal of customer interest, the project was hit by a large number of order cancellations. The Paris Le Bourget air show crash of the competing Soviet Tupolev Tu-144 had shocked potential buyers, and public concern over the environmental issues presented by a supersonic aircraft—the sonic boom, takeoff noise and pollution—had produced a shift in public opinion of SSTs. By 1976 four nations remained as prospective buyers, Britain, France, China, and Iran. Only Air France and British Airways the successor to BOAC took up their orders, with the two governments taking a cut of any profits made. The United States government cut federal funding for the Boeing 2707, its rival supersonic transport program. In 1971, Boeing did not complete its two 2707 prototypes. The US, India, and Malaysia all ruled out Concorde supersonic flights over the noise concern, although some of these restrictions were later relaxed. 
Professor Douglas Ross characterized restrictions placed upon Concord operations by President Jimmy Carter's administration as having been an act of protectionism of American aircraft manufacturers. Concorde flew to an altitude of 68,000 feet 20, meters during a test flight in June 1973. <laughs> Design <laughs> <laughs> General features Concorde is an Ogilvy Delta winged aircraft with four Olympus engines based on those employed in the RAF's Avro Vulcan strategic bomber. It is one of the few commercial aircraft to employ a tailless design, the tuple of Tu-144 being another. Concorde was the first airliner to have a, in this case, analog, fly-by-wire flight control system. The avionics system Concorde used was unique because it was the first commercial aircraft to employ hybrid circuits. The principal designer for the project was Pierre Satter, with Sir Archibald Russell as his deputy. Concorde pioneered the following technologies for high speed and optimization of flight, double delta Ogi, Ogival, shaped wings, variable engine air intake ramp system controlled by digital computers, supercruise capability, thrust by wire engines, predecessor of today's FADEC controlled engines. Troop nose section for better landing visibility, vor weight saving, and enhanced performance. Mach 2.02, approximately 2,154 km per hour or 1,338 miles per hour, cruising speed for optimum fuel consumption. Supersonic drag minimum and turbojet engines are more efficient at higher speed. Fuel consumption at Mach 2.0 and at altitude of 60,000 feet, 18,000 meters, was 4,800 gallons per hour, 22,000 lh. Mainly aluminium construction using a high temperature alloy similar to that developed for aero engine pistons. This material gave low weight and allowed conventional manufacture, higher speeds would have ruled out aluminium. Full regime autopilot and autothrottle allowing hands off control of the aircraft from climb out to landing. Fully electrically controlled analog fly by wire flight controls systems. High pressure hydraulic system using 28 megapascals 4000 lbf in squared for lighter hydraulic components tripled independent systems blue green and yellow for redundancy with an emergency ram air turbine rat stored in the port inner 11 jack fairing supplying green and yellow as backup Complex Air Data Computer ADC for the automated monitoring and transmission of aerodynamic measurements total pressure, static pressure, angle of attack, side slip. Fully electrically controlled analog brake by wire system Pitch trim by shifting fuel for and AFT for center of gravity COFG control at the approach to Mach 1 and above with no drag penalty. Pitch trimming by fuel transfer had been used since 1958 on the B-58 supersonic bomber. Parts made using sculpture milling, reducing the part count while saving weight and adding strength. No auxiliary power unit, as Concorde would only visit large airports where ground air start carts are available. Topic: <laughs> Power plant. A symposium titled, ''Supersonic Transport Implications'' was hosted by the Royal Aeronautical Society on 8 December 1960. Various views were put forward on the likely type of powerplant for a supersonic transport, such as potted or buried installation and turbojet or ducted fan engines. Boundary layer management in the potted installation was put forward as simpler with only an inlet cone but Dr. Seddon of the Ray saw a future in a more sophisticated integration of shapes in a buried installation. Another concern highlighted the case with two or more engines situated behind a single intake. An intake failure could lead to a double or triple engine failure. The advantage of the ducted fan over the turbojet was reduced airport noise but with considerable economic penalties with its larger cross-section producing excessive drag. 
At that time it was considered that the noise from a turbojet optimized for supersonic cruise could be reduced to an acceptable level using noise suppressors as used on subsonic jets. The power plant configuration selected for Concorde, and its development to a certificated design, can be seen in light of the above symposium topics which highlighted airfield noise, boundary layer management and interactions between adjacent engines and the requirement that the power plant, at Mach 2, tolerate combinations of pushovers, sideslips, pull-ups and throttle slamming without surging. Extensive development testing with design changes and changes to intake and engine control laws would address most of the issues except airfield noise and the interaction between adjacent power plants at speeds above Mach 1.6 which meant Concorde had to be certified aerodynamically as a twin-engined aircraft above Mach 1.6. Rolls-Royce had a design proposal, the RB.169, for the aircraft at the time of Concorde's initial design but to develop a brand new engine for Concorde would have been prohibitively expensive." So an existing engine, already flying in the TSR-2 prototype, was chosen. It was the Olympus 320 turbojet, a development of the Bristol engine first used for the Avro Vulcan bomber. Great confidence was placed in being able to reduce the noise of a turbojet and massive strides by SNECMA in silencer design were reported during the program. However, by 1974 the spade silencers which projected into the exhaust were reported to be ineffective. The Olympus Mk.622 with reduced jet velocity was proposed to reduce the noise but it was not developed. Situated behind the leading edge of the wing the engine intake had wing boundary layer ahead of it. Two thirds was diverted and the remaining third which entered the intake did not adversely affect the intake efficiency except during pushovers when the boundary layer thickened ahead of the intake and caused surging. Extensive wind tunnel testing helped define leading edge modifications ahead of the intakes which solved the problem. Each engine had its own intake and the engine nacelles were paired with a splitter plate between them to minimize adverse behavior of one power plant influencing the other. Only above Mach 1.6 was an engine surge likely to affect the adjacent engine. Concorde needed to fly long distances to be economically viable, this required high efficiency from the power plant. Turbofan engines were rejected due to their larger cross section producing excessive drag. Olympus turbojet technology was available to be developed to meet the design requirements of the aircraft. Although turbofans would be studied for any future SST, the aircraft used reheat afterburners at takeoff and to pass through the upper transonic regime and to supersonic speeds between Mach 0.95 and Mach 1.7. The afterburners were switched off at all other times. Due to jet engines being highly inefficient at low speeds, Concorde burned two tons of fuel, almost 2% of the maximum fuel load, taxiing to the runway. Fuel used is Jet A1. Due to the high thrust produced even with the engines at idle, only the two outer engines were run after landing for easier taxiing and less brake pad wear. At low weights after landing, the aircraft would not remain stationary with all four engines idling, requiring the brakes to be continuously applied to prevent the aircraft from rolling. The intake design for Concorde's engines was especially critical. The intakes had to provide low distortion levels to prevent engine surge and high efficiency for all likely ambient temperatures to be met in cruise. They had to provide adequate subsonic performance for diversion cruise and low engine face distortion at takeoff. They also had to provide an alternative path for excess intake air during engine throttling or shutdowns. The variable intake features required to meet all these requirements consisted of front and rear ramps, a dump door, an auxiliary inlet and a ramp bleed to the exhaust nozzle, as well as supplying air to the engine. The intake also supplied air through the ramp bleed to the propelling nozzle. The nozzle ejector or aerodynamic design, with variable exit area and secondary flow from the intake, contributed to good expansion efficiency from takeoff to cruise. Engine failure causes problems on conventional subsonic aircraft. Not only does the aircraft lose thrust on that side, but the engine creates drag, causing the aircraft to yaw and bank in the direction of the failed engine. If this had happened to Concorde at supersonic speeds, it theoretically could have caused a catastrophic failure of the airframe. Although computer simulations predicted considerable problems, in practice Concorde could shut down both engines on the same side of the aircraft at Mach 2 without the predicted difficulties. During an engine failure the required air intake is virtually zero. 
So, on Concord, engine failure was countered by the opening of the auxiliary spill door and the full extension of the ramps, which deflected the air downwards past the engine, gaining lift and minimizing drag. Concord pilots were routinely trained to handle double engine failure. Concord's air intake control units (AICUs) made use of a digital processor to provide the necessary accuracy for intake control. It was the world's first use of a digital processor to be given full authority control of an essential system in a passenger aircraft. It was developed by the Electronics and Space Systems S division of the British Aircraft Corporation after it became clear that the analog AICUs fitted to the prototype aircraft and developed by Ultra Electronics were found to be insufficiently accurate for the tasks in hand. Concorde's thrust by wire engine control system was developed by Ultra Electronics. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Heating problems. Air compression on the outer surfaces caused the cabin to heat up during flight. Every surface, such as windows and panels, was warm to the touch by the end of the flight. Besides engines, the hottest part of the structure of any supersonic aircraft is the nose, due to aerodynamic heating. The engineers used hidaminium RR-58, an aluminium alloy, throughout the aircraft because of its familiarity, cost and ease of construction. The highest temperature that aluminium could sustain over the life of the aircraft was 127 degrees Celsius 261 degrees Fahrenheit, which limited the top speed to Mach 2.02. Concorde went through two cycles of heating and cooling during a flight, first cooling down as it gained altitude, then heating up after going supersonic. The reverse happened when descending and slowing down. This had to be factored into the metallurgical and fatigue modeling. A test rig was built that repeatedly heated up a full-size section of the wing, and then cooled it, and periodically samples of metal were taken for testing. The Concorde airframe was designed for a life of 45,000 flying hours. Owing to air compression in front of the plane as it traveled at supersonic speed, the fuselage heated up and expanded by as much as 300 mm almost one foot. The most obvious manifestation of this was a gap that opened up on the flight deck between the flight engineer's console and the bulkhead. On some aircraft that conducted a retiring supersonic flight, the flight engineers placed their caps in this expanded gap, wedging the cap when it shrank again. To keep the cabin cool, Concorde used the fuel as a heat sink for the heat from the air conditioning. The same method also cooled the hydraulics. During supersonic flight the surfaces forward from the cockpit became heated, and a visor was used to deflect much of this heat from directly reaching the cockpit. Concorde had livery restrictions, the majority of the surface had to be covered with a highly reflective white paint to avoid overheating the aluminium structure due to heating effects from supersonic flight at Mach 2. The white finish reduced the skin temperature by 6 to 11 degrees Celsius. In 1996, Air France briefly painted FBTSD in a predominantly blue livery, with the exception of the wings, in a promotional deal with Pepsi. In this paint scheme, Air France was advised to remain at Mach 2 for no more than 20 minutes at a time, but there was no restriction at speeds under Mach 1.7. FBTSD was used because it was not scheduled for any long flights that required extended Mach 2 operations. Topic. Structural issues Due to its high speeds, large forces were applied to the aircraft during banks and turns, and caused twisting and distortion of the aircraft structure. In addition there were concerns over maintaining precise control at supersonic speeds. Both of these issues were resolved by active ratio changes between the inboard and outboard 11s, varying at differing speeds including supersonic. Only the innermost 11s, which are attached to the stiffest area of the wings, were active at high speed. Additionally, the narrow fuselage meant that the aircraft flexed. This was visible from the rear passenger's viewpoints. When any aircraft passes the critical Mach of that particular airframe, the center of pressure shifts rearwards. This causes a pitch down moment on the aircraft if the center of gravity remains where it was. The engineers designed the wings in a specific manner to reduce this shift, but there was still a shift of about 2 meters. This could have been countered by the use of trim controls, but at such high speeds this would have dramatically increased drag. 
Instead, the distribution of fuel along the aircraft was shifted during acceleration and deceleration to move the center of gravity, effectively acting as an auxiliary trim control. Topic. Range To fly nonstop across the Atlantic Ocean, Concorde required the greatest supersonic range of any aircraft. This was achieved by a combination of engines which were highly efficient at supersonic speeds, a slender fuselage with high finest ratio, and a complex wing shape for a high lift-to-drag ratio. This also required carrying only a modest payload and a high fuel capacity, and the aircraft was trimmed with precision to avoid unnecessary drag. Nevertheless, soon after Concorde began flying, a Concorde B model was designed with slightly larger fuel capacity and slightly larger wings with leading edge slats to improve aerodynamic performance at all speeds, with the objective of expanding the range to reach markets in new regions. It featured more powerful engines with sound deadening and without the fuel-hungry and noisy afterburner. It was speculated that it was reasonably possible to create an engine with up to 25% gain in efficiency over the Rolls-Royce Snecma Olympus 593. This would have given 500 miles 805 kilometers additional range and a greater payload, making new commercial routes possible. This was cancelled due in part to poor sales of Concorde, but also to the rising cost of aviation fuel in the 1970s. Topic. Radiation concerns Concorde's high cruising altitude meant passengers received almost twice the flux of extraterrestrial ionizing radiation as those traveling on a conventional long-haul flight. Upon Concorde's introduction, it was speculated that this exposure during supersonic travels would increase the likelihood of skin cancer. Due to the proportionally reduced flight time, the overall equivalent dose would normally be less than a conventional flight over the same distance. Unusual solar activity might lead to an increase in incident radiation. To prevent incidents of excessive radiation exposure, the flight deck had a radiometer and an instrument to measure the rate of decrease of radiation. If the radiation level became too high, Concorde would descend below 47,000 feet 14,000 meters. Topic. Cabin pressurization Airliner cabins were usually maintained at a pressure equivalent to 6,000 to 8,000 feet 1,800 to 2,400 meters elevation. Concorde's pressurization was set to an altitude at the lower end of this range, 6,000 feet 1,800 meters. Concorde's maximum cruising altitude was 60,000 feet 18,000 meters. Subsonic airliners typically cruise below 44,000 feet 13,000 meters. A sudden reduction in cabin pressure is hazardous to all passengers and crew. Above 50,000 feet 15,000 meters, a sudden cabin depressurization would leave a time of useful consciousness", up to 10 to 15 seconds for a conditioned athlete. At Concorde's altitude, the air density is very low, a breach of cabin integrity would result in a loss of pressure severe enough that the plastic emergency oxygen masks installed on other passenger jets would not be effective and passengers would soon suffer from hypoxia despite quickly donning them. Concorde was equipped with smaller windows to reduce the rate of loss in the event of a breach, a reserve air supply system to augment cabin air pressure, and a rapid descent procedure to bring the aircraft to a safe altitude. The FAA enforces minimum emergency descent rates for aircraft and noting Concorde's higher operating altitude, concluded that the best response to pressure loss would be a rapid descent. Continuous positive airway pressure would have delivered pressurized oxygen directly to the pilots through masks. Topic. Flight characteristics While subsonic commercial jets took eight hours to fly from New York to Paris, the average supersonic flight time on the transatlantic routes was just under 3.5 hours. 
Concorde had a maximum cruise altitude of 18,300 meters (60,039 feet) and an average cruise speed of Mach 2.02, about 1,155 knots (2,140 kilometers per hour) or 1,334 miles per hour), more than twice the speed of conventional aircraft, with no other civil traffic operating at its cruising altitude of about 56,000 feet (17,000 meters). Concorde had exclusive use of dedicated oceanic airways, or tracks, separate from the North Atlantic tracks, the routes used by other aircraft to cross the Atlantic. Due to the significantly less variable nature of high-altitude winds compared to those at standard cruising altitudes, these dedicated SST tracks had fixed coordinates, unlike the standard routes at lower altitudes, whose coordinates are replotted twice daily based on forecast weather patterns jet streams. Concorde would also be cleared in a 15,000-foot block, allowing for a slow climb from 45,000 to 60,000 feet 18, meters during the oceanic crossing as the fuel load gradually decreased. In regular service, Concorde employed an efficient cruise climb flight profile following takeoff. The delta shaped wings required Concorde to adopt a higher angle of attack at low speeds than conventional aircraft, but it allowed the formation of large low pressure vortices over the entire upper wing surface, maintaining lift. The normal landing speed was 170 miles per hour. 274 km per hour. Because of this high angle, during a landing approach Concorde was on the back side of the drag force curve, where raising the nose would increase the rate of descent. The aircraft was thus largely flown on the throttle and was fitted with an autothrottle to reduce the pilot's workload. The only thing that tells you that you're moving is that occasionally when you're flying over the subsonic aeroplanes you can see all these 747s 20,000 feet below you almost appearing to go backwards, I mean you are going 800 miles an hour or thereabouts faster than they are. The aeroplane was an absolute delight to fly, it handled beautifully. And remember we are talking about an aeroplane that was being designed in the late 1950s, mid-1960s. I think it's absolutely amazing and here we are, now in the 21st century, and it remains unique. Topic. Brakes and undercarriage Because of the way Concorde's delta wing generated lift, the undercarriage had to be unusually strong and tall to allow for the angle of attack at low speed. At rotation, Concorde would rise to a high angle of attack, about 18 degrees. Prior to rotation the wing generated almost no lift, unlike typical aircraft wings. Combined with the high airspeed at rotation, 199 knots indicated airspeed, this increased the stresses on the main undercarriage in a way that was initially unexpected during the development and required a major redesign. Due to the high angle needed at rotation, a small set of wheels was added AFT to prevent tail strikes. The main undercarriage units swing towards each other to be stowed but due to their great height also need to contract in length telescopically before swinging to clear each other when stowed. The four main wheel tires on each bogey unit are inflated to 232 pounds per square in 1,600 kilopascals. The twin wheel nose undercarriage retracts forwards and its tires are inflated to a pressure of 191 pounds per square in 1320 kilopascals and the wheel assembly carries a spray deflector to prevent standing water being thrown up into the engine intakes. The tires are rated to a maximum speed on the runway of 250 miles per hour, 400 kilometers per hour. The starboard nose wheel carries a single disc brake to halt wheel rotation during retraction of the undercarriage. The port nose wheel carries speed generators for the anti-skid braking system which prevents brake activation until nose and main wheels rotate at the same rate. Additionally, due to the high average takeoff speed of 250 miles per hour, 400 kilometers per hour, Concorde needed upgraded brakes. Like most airliners, Concorde has anti-skid braking, a system which prevents the tires from losing traction when the brakes are applied for greater control during rollout. The brakes, developed by Dunlop, were the first carbon-based brakes used on an airliner. The use of carbon over equivalent steel brakes provided a weight saving of 1,200 pounds, 540 kilograms. Each wheel has multiple discs which are cooled by electric fans. 
Wheel sensors include brake overload, brake temperature, and tire deflation. After a typical landing at Heathrow, brake temperatures were around 300 to 400 degrees Celsius, 570 to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Landing Concorde required a minimum of 6,000 feet 1, meters runway length, this in fact being considerably less than the shortest runway Concorde ever actually landed on, that of Cardiff Airport. Topic. Droop nose Concorde's drooping nose, developed by marshals of Cambridge at Cambridge Airport, enabled the aircraft to switch between being streamlined to reduce drag and achieve optimal aerodynamic efficiency without obstructing the pilot's view during taxi, takeoff, and landing operations. Due to the high angle of attack, the long pointed nose obstructed the view and necessitated the capability to droop. The droop nose was accompanied by a moving visor that retracted into the nose prior to being lowered. When the nose was raised to horizontal, the visor would rise in front of the cockpit windscreen for aerodynamic streamlining. A controller in the cockpit allowed the visor to be retracted and the nose to be lowered to 5 degrees below the standard horizontal position for taxiing and takeoff. Following takeoff and after clearing the airport, the nose and visor were raised. Prior to landing, the visor was again retracted and the nose lowered to 12.5 degrees below horizontal for maximal visibility. Upon landing the nose was raised to the 5 degrees position to avoid the possibility of damage. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration had objected to the restrictive visibility of the visor used on the first two prototype Concords, which had been designed before a suitable high-temperature window glass had become available, and thus requiring alteration before the FAA would permit Concorde to serve U.S. airports. This led to the redesigned visor used on the production and the four pre-production aircraft 101, 102, 201, and 202. The nose window and visor glass, needed to endure temperatures in excess of 100 degrees Celsius 210 degrees Fahrenheit at supersonic flight, were developed by Triplex. Topic. Operational history Topic: 1973 Solar Eclipse Mission. Concorde 001 was modified with rooftop portholes for use on the 1973 Solar Eclipse mission and equipped with observation instruments. It performed the longest observation of a solar eclipse to date, about 74 minutes. Topic: Scheduled flights. Scheduled flights began on 21 January 1976 on the London Bahrain and Paris Rio de Janeiro via DACA routes, with BA flights using the Speedbird Concorde call sign to notify air traffic control of the aircraft's unique abilities and restrictions, but the French using their normal call signs. The Paris Caracas route via Azores began on 10 April. The U.S. Congress had just banned Concorde landings in the U.S., mainly due to citizen protest over sonic booms, preventing launch on the coveted North Atlantic routes. The U.S. Secretary of Transportation, William Coleman, gave permission for Concorde service to Washington Dulles International Airport, and Air France and British Airways simultaneously began a thrice-weekly service to Dulles on 24 May 1976. Due to low demand, Air France cancelled its Washington service in October 1982, while British Airways cancelled it in November 1994. When the U.S. ban on JFK Concorde operations was lifted in February 1977, New York banned Concorde locally. The ban came to an end on 17 October 1977 when the Supreme Court of the United States declined to overturn a lower court's ruling rejecting efforts by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey and a grassroots campaign led by Carol Berman to continue the ban. In spite of complaints about noise, the noise report noted that Air Force One, at the time a Boeing VC-137, was louder than Concorde at subsonic speeds and during takeoff and landing. 
Scheduled service from Paris and London to New York's John F. Kennedy Airport began on the 22nd of November 1977. In 1977, British Airways and Singapore Airlines shared a Concorde for flights between London and Singapore International Airport at Pai Lai Bar via Bahrain. The aircraft, BA's Concorde G. Bode, was painted in Singapore Airlines livery on the port side and British Airways livery on the starboard side. The service was discontinued after three return flights because of noise complaints from the Malaysian government, it could only be reinstated on a new route bypassing Malaysian airspace in 1979. A dispute with India prevented Concorde from reaching supersonic speeds in Indian airspace, so the route was eventually declared not viable and discontinued in 1980. During the Mexican oil boom, Air France flew Concorde twice weekly to Mexico City's Benito Juarez International Airport via Washington, D.C., or New York City, from September 1978 to November 1982. The worldwide economic crisis during that period resulted in this route's cancellation. The last flights were almost empty. The routing between Washington or New York and Mexico City included a deceleration, from Mach 2.02 to Mach 0.95, to cross Florida subsonically and avoid creating a sonic boom over the state. Concorde then re accelerated back to high speed while crossing the Gulf of Mexico. On 1 April 1989, on an Around the World Luxury Tour charter, British Airways implemented changes to this routing that allowed GBOAF to maintain Mach 2.02 by passing around Florida to the east and south. Periodically Concorde visited the region on similar chartered flights to Mexico City and Acapulco. From December 1978 to May 1980, Braniff International Airways leased 11 Concords, five from Air France and six from British Airways. These were used on subsonic flights between Dallas-Fort Worth and Washington Dulles International Airport, flown by Braniff flight crews. Air France and British Airways crews then took over for the continuing supersonic flights to London and Paris. The aircraft were registered in both the United States and their home countries. The European registration was covered while being operated by Braniff, retaining full AF, BA liveries. The flights were not profitable and typically less than 50% booked, forcing Braniff to end its tenure as the only U.S. Concorde operator in May 1980. In its early years, the British Airways Concorde service had a greater number of no shows, passengers who booked a flight and then failed to appear at the gate for boarding, than any other aircraft in the fleet. Topic: <laughs> British Caledonian interest. Following the launch of British Airways Concorde services, Britain's other major airline, British Caledonian BCAL, set up a task force headed by Gordon Davidson, BA's former Concorde director, to investigate the possibility of their own Concorde operations. This was seen as particularly viable for the airline's long-haul network as there were two unsold aircraft then available for purchase. One important reason for B. Carl's interest in Concorde was that the British government's 1976 aviation policy review had opened the possibility of BA setting up supersonic services in competition with B. Carl's established sphere of influence. To counteract this potential threat, BCAL considered their own independent Concorde plans, as well as a partnership with BA. BCAL were considered most likely to have set up a Concorde service on the Gatwick Lagos route, a major source of revenue and profits within B. Carl's scheduled route network. B. Carl's Concorde Task Force did assess the viability of a daily supersonic service complementing the existing subsonic widebody service on this route. BCAL entered into a bid to acquire at least one Concorde. However, BCAL eventually arranged for two aircraft to be leased from BA and Aerospatia respectively, to be maintained by either BA or Air France. B. Carl's envisaged two Concorde fleet would have required a high level of aircraft usage to be cost effective, therefore, BCAL had decided to operate the second aircraft on a supersonic service between Gatwick and Atlanta, with a stopover at either Gander or Halifax. Consideration was given to services to Houston and various points on its South American network at a later stage. Both supersonic services were to be launched at some point during 1980, however, steeply rising oil prices caused by the 1979 energy crisis led to BCAL shelving their supersonic ambitions. Topic. British Airways buys its Concords outright. 
By around 1981 in the UK, the future for Concorde looked bleak. The British government had lost money operating Concorde every year, and moves were afoot to cancel the service entirely. A cost projection came back with greatly reduced metallurgical testing costs because the test rig for the wings had built up enough data to last for 30 years and could be shut down. Despite this, the government was not keen to continue. In 1983, BA's managing director, Sir John King, convinced the government to sell the aircraft outright to the then state-owned British Airways for £16.5 million plus the first year's profits. British Airways was subsequently privatised in 1987. <laughs> Operating economics In 1983, Pan American accused the British government of subsidising British Airways Concorde airfares, on which a return London New York was £2,399 in 2018 prices, compared to £1,986 £6 with a subsonic first class return, and London Washington return was £2,426 £8 instead of £2,200. £258 7, subsonic. Research revealed that passengers thought that the fare was higher than it actually was, so the airline raised ticket prices to match these perceptions. It is reported that British Airways then ran Concorde at a profit. Its estimated operating costs were $3,800 per block hour in 1972, compared to actual 1971 operating costs of $1,835 for a 707 and $3,500 for a 747. For a 3,050 NMI London New York sector, a 707 cost $13,750 or 3.04 C per seat. NMI a 747 $26,200 or 2.4 C per seat, NMI and the Concorde $14,250 or 4.5 C per seat, NMI. Other services Between March 1984 and March 1991, British Airways flew a thrice weekly Concorde service between London and Miami, stopping at Washington Dulles International Airport. Until 2003, Air France and British Airways continued to operate the New York services daily. From 1987 to 2003, British Airways flew a Saturday morning Concorde service to Grantley Adams International Airport, Barbados, during the summer and winter holiday season. Prior to the Air France Paris crash, several UK and French tour operators operated charter flights to European destinations on a regular basis. The charter business was viewed as lucrative by British Airways and Air France. In 1997, British Airways held a promotional contest to mark the 10th anniversary of the airline's move into the private sector. The promotion was a lottery to fly to New York held for 190 tickets valued at £5,400 each, to be offered at £10. Contestants had to call a special hotline to compete with up to 20 million people. Retirement <inaudible> 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 On 10 April 2003, Air France and British Airways simultaneously announced they would retire Concorde later that year. They cited low passenger numbers following the 25 July 2000 crash, the slump in air travel following the September 11 attacks, and rising maintenance costs. Airbus, the company that acquired Aerospatia in 2000, had made a decision in 2003 to no longer supply replacement parts for the aircraft. Although Concorde was technologically advanced when introduced in the 1970s, 30 years later, its analog cockpit was outdated. There had been little commercial pressure to upgrade Concorde due to a lack of competing aircraft, unlike other airliners of the same era such as the Boeing 747. By its retirement, it was the last aircraft in the British Airways fleet that had a flight engineer. Other aircraft, such as the modernised 747 to 400, had eliminated the role. On the 11th of April 2003, Virgin Atlantic founder Sir Richard Branson announced that the company was interested in purchasing British Airways Concorde fleet for the same price that they were given them for one pound. British Airways dismissed the idea, prompting Virgin to increase their offer to £1 million each. 
Branson claimed that when BA was privatised, a clause in the agreement required them to allow another British airline to operate Concorde if BA ceased to do so, but the government denied the existence of such a clause. In October 2003, Branson wrote in The Economist that his final offer was, "...over £5 million," and that he had intended to operate the fleet, "...for many years to come." The chances for keeping Concorde in service were stifled by Airbus's lack of support for continued maintenance. It has been suggested that Concorde was not withdrawn for the reasons usually given, but that it became apparent during the grounding of Concorde that the airlines could make more profit carrying first class passengers subsonically. A lack of commitment to Concorde from Director of Engineering Alan McDonald was cited as having undermined BA's resolve to continue operating Concorde. Other reasons why the attempted revival of Concorde never happened relate to the fact that the narrow fuselage did not allow for luxury features of subsonic air travel such as moving space, reclining seats, and overall comfort. In the words of The Guardian's Dave Hall, Concorde was an outdated notion of prestige that left sheer speed the only luxury of supersonic travel. Topic Air France Air France made its final commercial Concorde landing in the United States in New York City from Paris on 30 May 2003. Air France's final Concorde flight took place on 27 June 2003 when FBVFC retired to Toulouse. An auction of Concorde parts and memorabilia for Air France was held at Christie's in Paris on 15 November 2003. 1,300 people attended, and several lots exceeded their predicted values. French Concorde FBVFC was retired to Toulouse and kept functional for a short time after the end of service, in case taxi runs were required in support of the French judicial inquiry into the 2000 crash. The aircraft is now fully retired and no longer functional. French Concorde FBTSD has been retired to the Musée de l'Air at Paris Le Bourget Airport near Paris. Unlike the other museum Concordes, a few of the systems are being kept functional. For instance, the famous troop nose can still be lowered and raised. This led to rumors that they could be prepared for future flights for special occasions. French Concorde FBVFB is at the Auto and Technic Museum Sinsheim at Sinsheim, Germany, after its last flight from Paris to Baden-Baden, followed by a spectacular transport to Sinsheim via barge and road. The museum also has a tuple of Tu-144 on display. This is the only place where both supersonic airliners can be seen together. In 1989, Air France signed a letter of agreement to donate a Concorde to the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. upon the aircraft's retirement. On 12 June 2003, Air France honored that agreement, donating Concorde FBVFA, serial 205, to the museum upon the completion of its last flight. This aircraft was the first Air France Concorde to open service to Rio de Janeiro, Washington, D.C., and New York and had flown 17,824 hours. It is on display at the Smithsonian's Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center at Dulles Airport. Topic British Airways British Airways conducted a North American farewell tour in October 2003. G. Bogue visited Toronto Pearson International Airport on 1 October, after which it flew to New York's John F. Kennedy International Airport. G. Bogue visited Boston's Logan International Airport on 8 October, and G. Bogue visited Washington Dulles International Airport on 14 October. In a week of farewell flights around the United Kingdom, Concorde visited Birmingham on 20 October, Belfast on 21 October, Manchester on 22 October, Cardiff on 23 October, and Edinburgh on 24 October. Each day the aircraft made a return flight out and back into Heathrow to the cities, often overflying them at low altitude. On the 22nd of October, both Concorde Flight BA 9021C, a special from Manchester, and BA 002 from New York landed simultaneously on both of Heathrow's runways. On 23 October 2003, the Queen consented to the illumination of Windsor Castle, an honour reserved for state events and visiting dignitaries, as Concorde's last westbound commercial flight departed London. British Airways retired its Concorde fleet on 24 October 2003. G. Bogue left New York to a fanfare similar to that given for Air France's FBTSD, while two more made round trips, GBOAF over the Bay of Biscay, carrying VIP guests including former Concorde pilots, and GBOAE to Edinburgh. 
The three aircraft then circled over London, having received special permission to fly at low altitude, before landing in sequence at Heathrow. The captain of the New York to London flight was Mike Bannister. The final flight of a Concorde in the U.S. occurred on 5 November 2003 when G-Bogue flew from New York's JFK Airport to Seattle's Boeing Field to join the Museum of Flight's permanent collection. The plane was piloted by Mike Bannister and Les Brody, who claimed a flight time of 3 hours, 55 minutes and 12 seconds, a record between the two cities. The museum had been pursuing a Concorde for their collection since 1984. The final flight of a Concorde worldwide took place on 26 November 2003 with a landing at Filton, Bristol, UK. All of BA's Concorde fleet have been grounded, drained of hydraulic fluid and their airworthiness certificates withdrawn. Jock Lowe, ex-chief Concorde pilot and manager of the fleet estimated in 2004 that it would cost £10 minus £15 million to make GBOAF airworthy again. BA maintain ownership and have stated that they will not fly again due to a lack of support from Airbus. On 1 December 2003, Bonhams held an auction of British Airways Concorde artefacts, including a nose cone, at Kensington Olympia in London. Proceeds of around £750,000 were raised, with the majority going to charity. G-Boat is currently on display at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum in New York. In 2007, BA announced that the advertising spot at Heathrow where a 40% scale model of Concorde was located would not be retained. The model is now on display at the Brooklands Museum, in Surrey, England. Topic. Displays and restoration Concorde GBBDG was used for test flying and trials work. It was retired in 1981 and then only used for spares. It was dismantled and transported by road from Filton to the Brooklands Museum in Surrey where it was restored from essentially a shell. It remains open to visitors to the museum. Concorde G Boab, nicknamed Alpha Bravo, was never modified and returned to service with the rest of British Airways fleet, and has remained at London Heathrow Airport since its final flight, a ferry flight from JFK in 2000. The aircraft has been moved around the apron at Heathrow several times, and can be regularly seen from other aircraft departing or arriving at the airport. G Boab is also occasionally used by BA for apprentice training. One of the youngest Concordes FBTSD is on display at Le Bourget Air and Space Museum in Paris. In February 2010, it was announced that the museum and a group of volunteer Air France technicians intend to restore FBTSD so it can taxi under its own power. In May 2010, it was reported that the British Save Concorde Group and French Olympus 593 groups had begun inspecting the engines of a Concorde at the French Museum. Their intent was to restore the airliner to a condition where it could fly in demonstrations. GBOAF forms the centerpiece of the Aerospace Bristol Museum at Filton, which opened to the public in 2017. Topic: Return to service plan. On 15 September 2015, Club Concorde announced it had secured over £160 million to return an aircraft to service. Club Concorde President Paul James said, The main obstacle to any Concorde project to date has been, Where's the money? A question we heard ad nauseum, until we found an investor. Now that money is no longer the problem it's over to those who can help us make it happen. The organization aims to buy the Concorde currently on display at Le Bourget Airport. A tentative date of 2019 has been put forward for the return to flight—50 years after its maiden journey. However, due to regulatory and technical hurdles, some of the aviation community are highly skeptical of the plan, including former Concorde captain and Club Concorde co-founder William Jock Lowe, who was quoted in June 2016 saying, Let's assume you could rip the whole thing apart and ultrasound the fuselage. There are thousands, many thousands of hydraulic seals on the airplane. Every one of them would have to be remanufactured and replaced. But the manufacturing facilities are just not there. Dot dot dot. And if you got them all together, what sort of testing regimen would be there? Dot dot dot. 
It took seven years of flight testing to get it into service in the first place. Operators Air France British Airways Braniff International Airways one on short term lease Singapore Airlines one on short term wet lease topic accidents and incidents topic Air France flight 4590 On 25 July 2000, Air France Flight 4590, registration FBTSC, crashed in Gonesse, France after departing from Paris Charles de Gaulle en route to John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York City, killing all 100 passengers and nine crew members on board the flight, and four people on the ground. It was the only fatal accident involving Concorde. According to the official investigation conducted by the Bureau d'Enquêtes et d'Analyses pour la Sécurité de l'Aviation Civile B, the crash was caused by a metallic strip that had fallen from a Continental Airlines DC-10 that had taken off minutes earlier. This fragment punctured a tire on Concorde's left main wheel bogey during takeoff. The tire exploded, and a piece of rubber hit the fuel tank, which caused a fuel leak and led to a fire. The crew shut down engine number two in response to a fire warning, and with engine number one surging and producing little power, the aircraft was unable to gain altitude or speed. The aircraft entered a rapid pitch up then a sudden descent, rolling left and crashing tail low into the Hotelissimo Les Relais Blues Hotel in Gonesse. The claim that a metallic strip caused the crash was disputed during the trial both by witnesses including the pilot of then French President Jacques Chirac's aircraft that had just landed on an adjacent runway when Flight 4590 caught fire, and by an independent French TV investigation that found a wheel spacer had not been installed in the left side main gear and that the plane caught fire some one thousand feet from where the metallic strip lay. British investigators and former French Concorde pilots looked at several other possibilities that the B report ignored, including an unbalanced weight distribution in the fuel tanks and loose landing gear. They came to the conclusion that the Concorde veered off course on the runway, which reduced takeoff speed below the crucial minimum. John Hutchinson, who had served as a Concorde captain for 15 years with British Airways, said, The fire on its own should have been eminently survivable, the pilot should have been able to fly his way out of trouble. Had it not been for a lethal combination of operational error and negligence by the maintenance department of Air France that nobody wants to talk about. On 6 December 2010, Continental Airlines and John Taylor, a mechanic who installed the metal strip, were found guilty of involuntary manslaughter, but on 30 November 2012, a French court overturned the conviction, saying mistakes by Continental and Taylor did not make them criminally responsible. Prior to the accident, Concorde had been arguably the safest operational passenger airliner in the world in passenger deaths per kilometers traveled with zero, but there had been two prior non-fatal accidents and a rate of tire damage some 30 times higher than subsonic airliners from 1995 to 2000. Safety improvements were made in the wake of the crash, including more secure electrical controls, Kevlar lining on the fuel tanks and specially developed burst-resistant tires. The first flight with the modifications departed from London Heathrow on 17 July 2001, piloted by BA Chief Concorde pilot Mike Bannister. During the three-hour 20-minute flight over the mid-Atlantic towards Iceland, Bannister attained Mach 2.02 and 60,000 feet 18,000 meters before returning to RAF Bryce Norton. The test flight, intended to resemble the London-New York route, was declared a success and was watched on live TV, and by crowds on the ground at both locations. The first flight with passengers after the accident took place on of September 2001, landing shortly before the World Trade Center attacks in the U.S. This was not a commercial flight, all the passengers were BA employees. Normal commercial operations resumed on the 7th of November 2001 by BA and AF aircraft GBOAE and FBTSD with service to New York JFK where Mayor Rudy Giuliani greeted the passengers. Topic: Other accidents and incidents. 
Concorde had suffered two previous non-fatal accidents that were similar to each other. 12 April 1989, a Concorde of British registration, GBOAF, on a chartered flight from Christchurch, New Zealand, to Sydney, suffered a structural failure in flight at supersonic speed. As the aircraft was climbing and accelerating through Mach 1.7 a thud was heard. The crew did not notice any handling problems, and they assumed the thud they heard was a minor engine surge. No further difficulty was encountered until descent through 40,000 feet at Mach 1.3, when a vibration was felt throughout the aircraft, lasting two to three minutes. Most of the upper rudder had become separated from the aircraft at this point. Aircraft handling was unaffected, and the aircraft made a safe landing at Sydney. The UK's Air Accidents Investigation Branch AAIB concluded that the skin of the rudder had been separating from the rudder structure over a period of time before the accident due to moisture seepage past the rivets in the rudder. Furthermore, production staff had not followed proper procedures during an earlier modification of the rudder, but the procedures were difficult to adhere to. The aircraft was repaired and returned to service. 21 March 1992, a Concorde of British registration, GBOAB, on a scheduled flight from London to New York, also suffered a structural failure in flight at supersonic speed. While cruising at Mach 2, at approximately 53,000 feet above mean sea level, the crew heard a thump. No difficulties in handling were noticed, and no instruments gave any irregular indications. This crew also suspected there had been a minor engine surge. One hour later, during descent and while decelerating below Mach 1.4, a sudden, severe, vibration began throughout the aircraft. The vibration worsened when power was added to the number 2 engine, and it was attenuated when that engine's power was reduced. The crew shut down the number 2 engine and made a successful landing in New York, noting only that increased rudder control was needed to keep the aircraft on its intended approach course. Again, the skin had become separated from the structure of the rudder, which led to most of the upper rudder becoming separated in flight. The AAIB concluded that repair materials had leaked into the structure of the rudder during a recent repair, weakening the bond between the skin and the structure of the rudder, leading to it breaking up in flight. The large size of the repair had made it difficult to keep repair materials out of the structure, and prior to this accident, the severity of the effect of these repair materials on the structure and skin of the rudder was not appreciated. The 2010 trial involving Continental Airlines over the crash of Flight 4590 established that from 1976 until Flight 4590 there had been 57 tire failures involving Concords during takeoffs, including a near crash at Dulles Airport on 14 June 1979 involving Air France Flight 54 where a tire blowout pierced the plane's fuel tank and damaged the port side engine and electrical cables, with the loss of two of the craft's hydraulic systems. Topic. Aircraft on display Of the 20 aircraft built, 18 remain in good condition. Many are on display at museums in the United Kingdom, France, the United States, Germany and Barbados. Topic. Comparable aircraft Topic two one hundred and forty four. The only supersonic airliner in direct competition with Concorde was the Soviet Tupolev Tu one hundred and forty four, nicknamed Concordsky by Western European journalists for its outward similarity to Concorde. It had been alleged that Soviet espionage efforts had resulted in the theft of Concorde blueprints, supposedly to assist in the design of the Tu one hundred and forty four. As a result of a rushed development program, the first Tu-144 prototype was substantially different from the pre-production machines, but both were cruder than Concorde. The Tu-144S had a significantly shorter range than Concorde. Jean Rec, Sud Aviation, attributed this to two things, a very heavy powerplant with an intake twice as long as that on Concorde, and low-bypass turbofan engines with too high a bypass ratio which needed afterburning for crews. The aircraft had poor control at low speeds because of a simpler supersonic wing design. In addition, the Tu-144 required braking parachutes to land, while Concorde used anti-lock brakes. 
The Tu-144 had two crashes, one at the 1973 Paris Air Show, and another during a pre-delivery test flight in May 1978. Later production Tu-144 versions were more refined and competitive. They had retractable canards for better low-speed control, turbojet engines providing nearly the fuel efficiency and range of Concorde and a top speed of Mach 2.35. Passenger service commenced in November 1977, but after the 1978 crash the aircraft was taken out of passenger service after only 55 flights, which carried an average of 58 passengers. The aircraft had an inherently unsafe structural design as a consequence of an automated production method chosen to simplify and speed up manufacturing. <laughs> SST and others. The American designs, the SST project for supersonic transport were the Boeing 2707 and the Lockheed L2000. These were to have been larger, with seating for up to 300 people. Running a few years behind Concorde, the Boeing 2707 was redesigned to a cropped Delta layout. The extra cost of these changes helped to kill the project. The operation of U.S. military aircraft such as the Mach 3 Plus North American XB-70 Valkyrie prototypes and Convair B-58 Hustler strategic nuclear bomber had shown that sonic booms were quite capable of reaching the ground, and the experience from the Oklahoma City sonic boom tests led to the same environmental concerns that hindered the commercial success of Concorde. The American government canceled its SST project in 1971 after having spent more than 1 billion dollars. The only other large supersonic aircraft comparable to Concorde are strategic bombers, principally the Russian Tu-22, Tu-22M, M-50 experimental, T-4 experimental, Tu-160 and the American XB-70 experimental and B-1. Topic: Impact Topic. Environmental Before Concorde's flight trials, developments in the civil aviation industry were largely accepted by governments and their respective electorates. Opposition to Concorde's noise, particularly on the east coast of the United States, forged a new political agenda on both sides of the Atlantic, with scientists and technology experts across a multitude of industries beginning to take the environmental and social impact more seriously. Although Concorde led directly to the introduction of a general noise abatement program for aircraft flying out of John F. Kennedy Airport, many found that Concorde was quieter than expected, partly due to the pilots temporarily throttling back their engines to reduce noise during overflight of residential areas. Even before commercial flights started, it had been claimed that Concorde was quieter than many other aircraft. In 1971, BAC's technical director was quoted as saying, it is certain on present evidence and calculations that in the airport context, production Concords will be no worse than aircraft now in service and will in fact be better than many of them." Concorde produced nitrogen oxides in its exhaust, which, despite complicated interactions with other ozone-depleting chemicals, are understood to result in degradation to the ozone layer at the stratospheric altitudes it cruised. It has been pointed out that other, lower-flying, airliners produce ozone during their flights in the troposphere, but vertical transit of gases between the layers is restricted. The small fleet meant overall ozone layer degradation caused by Concorde was negligible. In 1995, David Fay, of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States, warned that a fleet of 500 supersonic aircraft with exhaust similar to Concorde might produce a 2% drop in global ozone levels, much higher than previously thought. Each 1% drop in ozone is estimated to increase the incidence of non-melanoma skin cancer worldwide by 2%. Dr. Fay said if these particles are produced by highly oxidized sulfur in the fuel, as he believed, then removing sulfur in the fuel will reduce the ozone destroying impact of supersonic transport. Concorde's technical leap forward boosted the public's understanding of conflicts between technology and the environment as well as awareness of the complex decision analysis processes that surround such conflicts. In France, the use of acoustic fencing alongside TGV tracks might not have been achieved without the 1970s controversy over aircraft noise. 
In the UK, the CPRE has issued tranquility maps since 1990. Some sources say Concorde typically flew 17 miles per US gallon, 14L, 100 kilometers, 20 mpg imp per passenger. Topic: <laughs> Public perception. Concorde was normally perceived as a privilege of the rich, but special circular or one-way with return by other flight or ship charter flights were arranged to bring a trip within the means of moderately well-off enthusiasts. The aircraft was usually referred to by the British as simply Concorde. In France it was known as La Concorde, due to Le, the definite article, used in French grammar to introduce the name of a ship or aircraft and the capital being used to distinguish a proper name from a common noun of the same spelling. In French, the common noun concorde means, "...agreement, harmony, or peace". Concorde's pilots and British Airways in official publications often refer to concorde both in the singular and plural as, "...she", or "...her". As a symbol of national pride, an example from the BA fleet made occasional flypasts at selected royal events, major air shows and other special occasions, sometimes in formation with the Red Arrows. On the final day of commercial service, public interest was so great that grandstands were erected at Heathrow Airport. Significant numbers of people attended the final landings. The event received widespread media coverage. In 2006, 37 years after its first test flight, Concorde was announced the winner of the Great British Design Quest organised by the BBC and the Design Museum. A total of 212,000 votes were cast with Concorde beating other British design icons such as the Mini, Mini Skirt, Jaguar E Type, Tube Map, the World Wide Web, K2 Telephone Box, and the Supermarine Spitfire. Topic. Special missions The heads of France and the United Kingdom flew Concorde many times. Presidents Georges Pompidou, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing and François Mitterrand regularly used Concorde as French flagman aircraft in foreign visits. Queen Elizabeth II and Prime Ministers Edward Heath, Jim Callaghan, Margaret Thatcher, John Major and Tony Blair took Concorde in some charter flights such as the Queen's trips to Barbados on her Silver Jubilee in 1977, in 1987 and in 2003, to the Middle East in 1984 and to the United States in 1991. Pope John Paul II flew on Concorde in May 1989. Concorde sometimes made special flights for demonstrations, air shows such as the Fambara, Paris Le Bourget, Oshkosh Airventure and Max Air shows, as well as parades and celebrations for example, of Zurich Airport's anniversary in 1998. The aircraft were also used for private charters including by the president of Zaire Mobutu Sese Seco on multiple occasions, for advertising companies including for the firm Oki, for Olympic torch relays 1992 Winter Olympics in Albertville and for observing solar eclipses, including the solar eclipse of June 30, 1973 and again for the total solar eclipse on August 11, 1999. Topic. Records The fastest transatlantic airliner flight was from New York JFK to London Heathrow on 7 February 1996 by the British Airways G Bode in 2 hours, 52 minutes, 59 seconds from takeoff to touchdown, aided by a 175 mph per hour tailwind. On 13 February 1985, a Concorde charter flight flew from London Heathrow to Sydney—on the opposite side of the world—in a time of 17 hours, 3 minutes and 45 seconds, including refueling stops. Concorde also set other records, including the official FI, Westbound Around the World, and Eastbound Around the World, World Air Speed Records. On 12 to 13 October 1992, in commemoration of the 500th anniversary of Columbus's first New World landing, Concorde Spirit Tours (US) chartered Air France Concorde FBTSD and circumnavigated the world in 32 hours 49 minutes and 3 seconds from Lisbon, Portugal, including six refueling stops at Santo Domingo, Acapulco, Honolulu, Guam, Bangkok, and Bahrain. The eastbound record was set by the same Air France Concorde FBTSD under charter to Concorde Spirit Tours in the U.S. on 15–16 August 1995
This promotional flight circumnavigated the world from New York, JFK International Airport in 31 hours 27 minutes 49 seconds, including six refueling stops at Toulouse, Dubai, Bangkok, Anderson AFB in Guam, Honolulu, and Acapulco. By its 30th flight anniversary on 2 March 1999 Concorde had clocked up 920,000 flight hours, with more than 600,000 supersonic, many more than all of the other supersonic aircraft in the Western world combined. On its way to the Museum of Flight in November 2003, G-Bogue set a New York City to Seattle speed record of 3 hours, 55 minutes, and 12 seconds. Due to the restrictions on supersonic overflights within the U.S. the flight was granted permission by the Canadian authorities for the majority of the journey to be flown supersonically over sparsely populated Canadian territory. <laughs> <laughs> Specifications Data from the Wall Street Journal, the Concorde Story, the International Directory of Civil Aircraft, General Characteristics Crew: three, two pilots and one flight engineer. Capacity: 92 to 120 passengers, 128 in high density layout. Length: 202 feet 4 in, 61.67 meters. Wingspan: 84 feet 0 in, 25.60 meters. Height: 40 feet 0 in, 12.19 meters. Wing area: 3,856 square feet, 358.2 square meters. Empty weight: 173,500 pounds, 78,698 kilograms. Gross weight: 245,000 pounds, 111,130 kilograms. Max takeoff weight: 408,000 pounds, 185,066 kilograms. Fuel capacity: 210,940 pounds, 95,680 kilograms. Fuselage internal length: 129 feet 0 in, 39.32 meters. Fuselage width: maximum of 9 feet 5 in, 2.87 meters. External: 8 feet 7 in, 2.62 meters. Internal. Fuselage height maximum of 10 feet 10 in 3.30 meters external 6 feet 5 in 1.96 meters internal maximum taxiing weight 412000 pounds 187000 kilograms power plant 4 times rolls royce snecma olympus 593 mk 610 afterburning turbojets 32000 lbf 140 kilonewtons thrust each dry 38050 lbf 169.3 kilonewtons with afterburner performance maximum speed 1354 miles per hour 2179 kilometers per hour 1177 knots Maximum speed, Mach 2.04. Cruise speed, 1,340 miles per hour, 2,157 kilometers per hour, 1,164 knots. Range, 4,488.04 miles, 3,900 nmi, 7,223 kilometers. Service ceiling, 60,000 feet, 18,000 meters. Rate of climb: 3,500 to 5,000 feet per minute, 18 to 25 meters per second at sea level. Lift to drag: low speed 3.94, approach 4.35, 250 knots, 10,000 feet 9.27, Mach 0.94 to 11.47, Mach 2.04 to 7.14. Fuel consumption: 46.85 pounds per mile, 13.20 kilograms per kilometer. Thrust weight zero, three hundred and seventy-three. Maximum nose tip temperature two hundred and sixty degrees Fahrenheit, one hundred and thirty degrees Celsius. Runway requirement with maximum load three thousand six hundred meters, eleven thousand eight hundred feet. Topic: Notable appearances in media. Topic. See also BAC 221 Barbara Harmer, the first qualified female Concorde pilot
North American XB-70 Valkyrie Anti-Concorde Project, Anti-Concorde Campaign-Related Development Bristol Type 223 Sud Aviation Super Caravelle Ferry Delta II Related lists List of jet airliners List of civil aircraft <laughs>